A few months ago, I put out a video on my little displacement sensor build, and a number of you very correctly pointed out that when measuring microns, temperature matters. So I thought it might be fun to take a closer look at the thermal sensitivity of that displacement sensor and see if we can't put some actual numbers to it. My assumption going into this testing was that the main source of this temp sensitivity was going to be the relatively high thermal expansion rate of the PETG I printed it from. But one thing I love about my line of work is how good data is at proving me wrong. The coefficient of thermal expansion, or CTE, for PETG plastic is around 70 parts per million per degree C. And with the 20 millimeter length it's acting over, I expected to see a tent sensitivity in the ballpark of 1.5 microns per degree. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. But more on that in a bit. I'm still very much learning what level of detail folks are willing to listen to me drone on about on YouTube, but characterizing error sources and uncertainties like this holds a special place in my heart. So if you like this kind of stuff and want the dives deeper, or if it brings you pain to endure and want them shallower, I'd love to hear it. But hopefully you'll indulge me on this one as I walk through the test setup, resulting data, and my conclusions from it. My goal for the test setup was basically to hold the sensor at a fixed displacement while exposing it to a range of temperatures. So any changes in the output from the sensor should be a result of thermal drift and not caused by any physical movement between the sensor and target. To accomplish this, allow me to introduce my good friend, the null block. Not a whole lot to these fellas in terms of design. It has mount points to rigidly attach the sensor and a fixed target surface for the stylus to sit against. At its core, that's really all there is to it. For this one, I also added a couple of blind holes to embed some temp sensors close to the action. In my experience, it's preferable to try and keep the null block made from a single piece of material to avoid any extra uncertainties caused by creep or other movements at joints. For this same reason, if you really want the decimal points, it's also a good idea to anneal the part after machining to keep the residual stresses from creeping on you. Or, you can go my route and get sidetracked for a couple of months after machining it. Hopefully it's all relaxed by now. I made this one from a block of 6061 aluminum because that's what I had on hand. Unfortunately, the realities of this choice introduce our first little challenge, and that's because aluminum has its own thermal expansion of about 22 ppm per degree C, which means the null block is going to be growing and shrinking as the temp varies during the test, so immediately my goal of fixed displacement isn't exactly going to happen. But since the CTE of the aluminum is known to within a couple of ppm and the path length is relatively short, I'll be able to compensate for it later. There are options out there with very low CTEs like Invar or zero dir, but they're quite pricey and difficult to work with, so I'm alright with correcting in post. Now that we've got our fixture ready to go, I needed a way to get some control over the temperature and the rates of change of those temperatures. Although it may be possible to just leave everything out on the table and use the normal temperature changes in the room, the challenge there is that the aluminum, plastic, sensors, and everything else have different thermal properties like conductivity and heat capacity, etc. So establishing the actual temps of everything can be extremely difficult. Since I'm already making work for myself on the analysis side with my frugal material selection, I at least want to make my life a little easier by having some control over those varying temps and their stability. Luckily, I have this very sophisticated thermal test chamber. Okay, it's a cooler, but it's kind of a fancy cooler. I got this guy for overlanding trips a few years ago and absolutely love it, but I love it even more now that I realize it has uses outside of road trips. Because it has a built-in refrigeration unit, I can easily test from ambient temps down to freezing, giving me a good range of temps to test across. But the cooler isn't really designed to hold temps all that stable. So to help smooth out the variations that come from the refrigeration unit cycling on and off, I surrounded the sensor and no block with a healthy amount of extra thermal mass and wrapped it all in some additional insulation. If you're an electronics fan, it's sort of like an RC smoothing circuit for heat, with the insulation as the resistor and the thermal mass as capacitance, he said, pretending he understands electronics in the slightest. All right, so now we've seen how I'm holding the sensor and varying the temp, but I can't know the sensitivity of the sensor to thermal changes if I don't know the actual changes in temperature. That brings us back to those extra couple of holes in the null block. In each of those holes, I potted a couple of bead thermistors. Why thermistors, you may ask? Honestly, it's largely an old habits die hard kind of thing. But I had a mentor long ago that swore by him for stable, precision temperature measurement, and over the years since, I've rarely found him to be incorrect about much. The ones I'm using here are NTC, or negative temperature coefficient thermistors. So if the temp goes up, their resistance goes down. Simple as that. But while there is much to love about them, thermistors do have their cons. One of which is that they're typically quite non-linear. This plot is the resistance first temp for the thermistors I'm using here. And as you can see, it's curvier than a country road. But since I'm only going to be using them over a small portion of their total range, let's zoom in and look at the range from 10 degrees to 30 degrees C. Definitely quite a bit better. If I flip it and subtract the linear fit points from the curve, we can quantify this error, and it's right around plus minus one degree. 
Not awful, and for a lot of applications, that'd work just fine. But I instead decided to go with using a lookup table to try and minimize the errors on that front. I could also go with a higher order fit, but once it goes beyond first order, I frequently prefer to just go with a lookup table and interpolate. Just pop in the measured resistance and interpolate for the corresponding temp. And that measured resistance part is the second challenge that comes with using thermistors, at least when compared to something like thermocouples that directly output a voltage. I don't know about you, but everything I have for data logging measures voltages, not resistances. So I need to convert my variable resistance thermistors into a variable voltage that I can measure. To do this, I use the good old Wheatstone bridge. But I didn't want to eat up my analog inputs to measure both legs of the bridge, so I cooked up a little something with the help of the fine folks over at PCBWay. My little thermistor driver board supports two separate channels of temperature measurement, and each goes into a differential amplifier, so it just outputs a single voltage for each channel. I selected the balancing resistors and amplifier gains so that it outputs 0 volts at 0 degrees C and 5 volts at 100 degrees C, since that covers the vast majority of my temp measuring needs. I'll try to limit my own embarrassment by not diving further into the details of the board here, but I'll link to the full details down below. If you're electronic savvy, I'd welcome suggestions for improvements, but please be kind and constructive. I'm a delicate mechanical monkey. All right, now that we got the no block cooler and controller board all set, it's time to start collecting some data. I used an Arduino R4 for my analog to digital converting needs, and a couple of Python scripts for retrieving and analyzing all those sweet, sweet bits. I started the testing by just letting everything settle for a few hours to let all the body heat from my grubby hands settle out. I then collected a few hours of data without temp changes to get an idea of the general stability of the sensor's output. And here's how that looked. Over the course of five hours, the output drifted a total of about 15 microns, while the temperature held stable to about plus minus 0.05 degrees C. But given how the drift does not appear random, I suspected this drift was something systematic. This is my not so subtle attempt at foreshadowing. How am I doing? But before diving deeper into that, let's take a look at what happened once I turned the cooler on and brought the temp down. Here are the temp plots showing the temp dropping from a little over 20 degrees C to about 10, which is what I set the cooler to. And we can see how all that thermal mass did a great job of making this take forever, taking right around a full day to make the 10 degree journey. And here is the corresponding displacement sensor data during the same period. Hmm. While there does definitely appear to be a correlation between the sensor output and the temp drop, that seemingly systematic error mentioned before made it very difficult to isolate what's what. That's what I get for can kicking, I suppose. But this is where some of the other comments on that previous video came to mind, pointing out the temperature sensitivity of electronics components and the driver. While my simple, mechanism-centric mind didn't think those air sources were going to play a major role here, I decided to add the drive circuit into the temperature-controlled environment and see what effect that had in the overall drift behavior. And boy were they right! This plot shows how the sensor data looked once the driver was being cooled along with the sensor body. The total variation over this 5 hour period was only about plus minus 2.5 microns. And looking at the temp data over that same period, it seems pretty clear that this drift data is very much correlated with the temperature. The sawtooth pattern showing up in both of these plots is the cycling on and off of the chiller unit. And this is exactly why that extra thermal mass is helpful. Although the sawtooth isn't great, it's only oscillating with an amplitude of about 0.05 degrees. As a comparison, Here's how the temp inside the cooler looks when cycling while it's empty. A very similar sawtooth profile, but this time it's oscillating by plus minus 0.2 degrees, or about four times the amount. So while all that thermal mass does make these tests take quite a bit longer, it also significantly improves the temp stability. But I digress. Jumping back to the task at hand, let's see how the thermal drift looked when both the sensor and driver are allowed to warm back up. Ah, much better. This time we see a much cleaner correlation between the measured temp and the sensor's output. Uh, applying a linear fit to this data, we can finally get ourselves the thermal sensitivity number we've been looking for. And it came out to right around 2.5 microns per degree C. But we also now need to apply the correction for the drift caused by the no block material itself. Since a block is growing and shrinking with the system, it's effectively reducing the amount of measured drift by however much it's moving. With a CTE of 22 and over the 20 millimeter length from the mount line to the contact line, the expected contribution from the block is just under half a micron per degree C. So adding this to our measured value of 2.5 gives a total drift of 3 microns per degree C, which is a little over double the drift I expected from the PET-G itself. While 3 microns per degree may not sound like a huge number, our body temp is about 17 degrees above the standard measurement temp of 20 degrees C. So by just handling the sensor and driver close to measurement time, you can pretty easily impart tens of microns of air into your measurements. But to put this in a bit of perspective, let's do a quick comparison against an industry standard sensor are using precision applications, a capacitance sensor, or cap probe. Commercial sensors generally quote their thermal drift as a full-scale percentage error per degree, which is the error value divided by the full range of the sensor. And for this cap gauge offering from Lion Precision, that value
value is given as 0.04% per degree. And this is pretty common across our lineup, although they do have some that go down to 0.02. The sensor we just tested has a total usable range of about 800 microns and an error of about 3 microns per degree C, which comes out to about 0.4% full scale per degree. So the cap gauge is about 10 times more thermally stable, but probably worth noting that the last time I bought one of these sensors for work, they cost me well over 5 grand. Don't get me wrong, if someone was handing out cap gauges, I'd take that all day over my printed alternative, but I thought the reference point may be handy. But anywho, I hope you've enjoyed this little exploration into thermal drift as much as I have. This was far from a complete characterization of the air sources of a sensor, but hopefully it gives a little extra insight into how temperature can impact measurements. Thanks so much for hanging here with me, and if you have any questions, comments, or the like, let me hear them. And thank you for everyone on the comments on the original video that led me down this path, and ultimately pointed me in the right direction. And last but certainly not least, a huge thanks to PCBWave for their support in sponsoring this video. And if you want to make a thermistor driver board of your own, help a guy out by using the link down below to make it happen. Happy building!